the keynote for today is uh, entitled the Deep Space Network Connect to uh, the Solar System. And the way you're going to do this today, uh, Dr. Les Deutsch is going to give us a presentation and we're going to have questions in the end. And I'm going to be moderating the questions here on Zoom and also on the chat on Slack. So uh, feel free to ask questions here and there. And um, when we, before we invited Dr. Les to give this, uh, Les Deutsch to give this keynote that was talking in a meeting with Oliver, the TPC chair, we're brainstorming like, hey, we have to, we should have nice to have some keynote here that's out of our comfort zone. That's not really the thing we do on a daily basis, like to inspire us, to challenge our points of view. And then I said, well, um, huh, did you guys were following, did you guys see this deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope? What a miracle that was. And James Webb is going to be shipping data back to Earth using, oh, what's called a deep space network. So I think that's a great network that probably can get someone to talk about it. And then we start looking more into that and eventually connect to folks at JPL. And I quite frankly had zero hopes um, to get someone to respond to us, but we were very lucky to get Dr. Les Deutsch to respond to us and he was very kind here uh, to come and give this talk. Um, so with further ado, let me introduce you, uh, Dr. Les Deutsch. We're very happy to have him here today. He's a deputy director of the Interplanetary Network Directorate at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Laboratory here in California. And um, um, he, um, let me see, let me get here to the, his biography, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Deutsch is, is a mathematics graduate from Caltech, has, very, has held various positions during the years in JPL, including management of several, several technology programs. He introduced advanced communications technology to the Galileo mission en route to Jupiter to compensate for the loss of its main antenna. He was also at uh, the NASA lead for the NASA ESA, the European Space Agency team that redesigned the huge and probe mission to Titan to mitigate an anomaly in the Cassini radio relay system. I mean, this is this real networking challenge that we're talking about here. Les was JPL's chief technologist for the 2002 fiscal year and developed the JPL strategy for the technology development. Along the way, he has published over 60 papers in fields of communications, microelectronics, and spacecraft systems. And he holds also 25 patents, mostly electronic music. Les also travels the world performing jazz festivals and giving organ concerts. He also holds an official joint appointment at Caltech as the institute organist. So without further ado, uh, uh, Les, oh, please carry on. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Giovanni. Um... So um, I'm very happy to be able to speak at, at this meeting. It's a bit out of my comfort zone as well. If you can see my video, you will see that I'm coming from you live from my home music studio, which has been my primary workspace since the start of the pandemic. We're sort of now at the at the part at the at um, the level where we come into JPL maybe once a week, unless we're actually working on spacecraft where we have to be there in a lab. So the next big thing I'm gonna do is share my screen, which hopefully you can see now. Yeah, I can see it. And now it's in presentation mode. So if I got if I gotten this far, I will succeed completely. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so um, so I am the deputy director of the of JPL's Interplanetary Network Directorate, which is the coolest name of any organization anywhere at any time. And I will just make you understand, although we are a, we are sort of a NASA laboratory at JPL, we're also part of the California Institute of Technology where we're, I'm a Caltech employee. So with that, I'm gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Deep Space Network to start. So NASA's Deep Space Network, which is usually called the DSN, because in NASA, we abbreviate everything we possibly can. So the DSN is the system we use on Earth to communicate with and navigate all of our spacecraft that go beyond geosynchronous Earth orbit. So if you look online to try to find a definition of deep space, what you'll discover is there's quite a gamut. It's everything from, from low Earth orbit to beyond the solar system. Our definition that we use at JPL is deep space is anything beyond geosynchronous orbit. <clears throat> so that's what I mean when I say deep space, at least. 
So one of the main functions of the DSN is, as I said, communications. And so it's like the internet in some ways, and it's not like the internet in other ways. And so, pardon my humor, you can conclude that the DSN is not equal to DNS. And with that, I'll stay away from the jokes. So I did say that the DSN is primarily used for communications, but that's not the only thing that we use the DSN for. We also use it as the primary mode of navigating all of our spacecraft that are in deep space. And that's because, of course, there is no GPS in deep space. I seem to be having a bandwidth problem with the screen sharing. Uh, that is annoying. I can see you clearly. I mean, maybe there's a little delay here, but the there's resolution. A, there's a, yeah, there appears to be a lot of delay. I'll, I'll live with it. Okay. I'll live with it. In fact, I'm going to talk about delay in a moment as one of our challenges. So basically, we have three kinds of measurements we make to try to navigate our spacecraft in deep space. The, the um, graphic you see, by the way, is the trajectory from, from a sun-centric view, heliocentric view, of the Dawn spacecraft, um, which launched in 2007 and went to the main asteroid belt to encounter two, two um, large asteroids. And all of the, the navigation of that during that, tra during that traverse was done using these three measurements. Um, ranging, which is the easiest one to understand, is measuring the distance to the spacecraft, which is basically the time it takes to send the signal from the DSN of the spacecraft, have it echo it back and receive it back on Earth. So that's a very easy uh, measurement to understand. Doppler is a measurement of the relative uh, motion of the spacecraft, and that's uh, basically the change in frequency from, well, from what we know the frequency to be that was transmitted on the spacecraft to its observed frequency on the Earth. And that's the same effect you get when when uh, a car goes by you and you hear and you hear the um, the sound of the engine raise in frequency and the lower in frequency again. It's the same effect. And then the third thing we do is something called delta difference one way ranging or delta door, which is using multiple DSN antennas to observe the spacecraft at the same time. And we basically do a triangulation measurement, which gives us a measurement of the angle that the line between the Earth and the spacecraft makes with the ground. And those three things together give us a very accurate position location of the spacecraft, and we can model that with time to do the navigation. So we also supplement this with data from onboard sensors on the spacecraft. Uh, for example, we often fly cameras on the spacecraft, not for photographing the objects we're going we're gonna to go visit, but for navigation itself. And, and we'll use these nav cameras to look at, say, the asteroid we're approaching against a stellar background, and that gives us additional navigation information. So, if you want to know what a, what a deep space network looks like, we have three locations around the world. This is an aerial view taken with a drone of our complex, which is what we call these things, um, in Australia, near the capital of Canberra. And you can see two sizes of antennas in this, in this photograph. To the right, we have our large antenna, which is 70 meters in diameter. So think of it as a football pitch that can be tilted. It's about that size. The other antennas, which I'd like to call small antennas, are 34 meters in diameter. So one half the diameter, one quarter the area of the 70 meter antenna. Only in the DSN would these be called small antennas. These are huge antennas. Uh, and they're quite powerful in their own right. This is a photograph of the complex we have at Goldstone in California. It's the closest one to me right now, but it's still a three hour drive from my house. You can see it's in a less hospitable place. It's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Uh, and what you see in here are three 34 meter antennas. The 70 meter antenna is about 26 kilometers from this site. So it can't be in the same photo. This is an antenna, this is the 70 meter antenna at our third complex, which is in Madrid or just outside of Madrid in Spain. So why do we have three of these? We have three, and you can see in, in the photograph, this is looking at the earth down from the North Pole. And you can see at the top, the view that the Goldstone complex has in the sky. It's sort of a cone and the view from Madrid, which is to the to the left, and the view from Canberra, which is to the right. 
and, and what you can see is these cones intersect at about 30,000 kilometers. So that by the time you're a geosync orbit, which is about 40,000 kilometers, any place out there is in view of at least one of, a, of the three DSN complexes at any time. So as the, as the Earth turns, if you are a spacecraft in deep space, you are guaranteed to be able to see at least one DSN complex from where you are. Unless, of course, you're behind a planet or something. We'll come back to that. But if, if you're not, you can communicate at any time you need to with the Earth, and you can communicate continuously if you need to for some special operations. That's why we have three complexes. So I said that the Deep Space Network or Deep Space Communications is sort of like the Internet. And here are, the, here are some of the similarities. All of the nodes in our communication system are connected together using a set of international standards. Today, um, they're all using radio, but we're actually working on optical standards as well. But for today, they're all radio. The terrestrial links, that is, once we get data to the ground or before we send it from the ground, we actually use the Internet. But we're on private networks for security reasons. And any country can have nodes. It, it, it's an international standard. Anybody can contribute to this network. You can place your spacecraft in space and be part of it. You can have ground stations like the DSN antennas of your own, and you can be part of the network as well. So in that way, we're very much like the Internet. The system is scalable. Uh, you can add new nodes fairly easily, both on Earth and in space. Some nodes serve as relays. That is, this is a multi-hop system like the Internet. Um, and in particular, as an example, any spacecraft that's in orbit around Mars doubles as a, as a relay satellite for anything that's landed on Mars. So all those nice pictures you see coming back from the surface of Mars or videos of our Mars helicopter, all of, those, all, all of the files that define those pictures have been relayed through orbiters around Mars before being returned to the DSN on Earth. Okay, and another reason that, that it, another thing that makes it like the internet is people always want more bandwidth than we actually have. We're always challenged to upgrade our network, although our upgrades are significantly more expensive than upgrading your, your computer or your modem or whatever. And then the final reason we're very much like the internet is people complain when there are outages, and there are outages. How are we not like the Internet? So we're not like the Internet in a lot of ways. So where shall I start? We have long distances between our nodes and really low signal levels. So our figure of merit for how well each link works is signal to noise ratio, which I will define here as EB over N0. E sub B is the energy that a spacecraft puts into each bit of information it's going to transmit. And N0 is the noise spectral density of the system. There's noise in the system. And the only mathematical equation I'm going to show you is this signal to noise ratio is, is equal to some constant over the square of the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. Distance is our enemy. And the table here really brings it home. So if you take geosynchronous distance as the baseline, that's four, as I say, 40,000 kilometers, as I said before, then if you take a spacecraft and actually move to the moon, all of a sudden, you can only get one one hundredth the data rate from it as you could when it was in geosync orbit, because the moon is 10 times as far away as geosync, and therefore it's 100 times more difficult to get the same signal to noise ratio. So a spacecraft at the moon gets only one one hundredth the data rate. If you go to Mars, it's one over 5.6 times 10 to the seventh, and it gets worse and worse. So it's very difficult to transmit things over these long distances. And as, as an example, we'll take the Voyager spacecraft. These are two spacecraft that were launched in 1977. So taking Voyager as an example, these spacecraft are so far away, they're actually out of the solar system. They're, they're interstellar spacecraft. They're the only two we have at the moment. Voyager 1, which is the furthest away, is a little bit more than 155 astronomical units from us. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it's 155 times further away from us than the Sun. And the time it takes light 
to get there and back, which is the same time it takes signals to get there and back, is about 42 hours um, at the moment. So that's a long time. That means if we send a message to it from Goldstone that the Earth turns one and a third times, or, or it, 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 no, more than, almost twice, almost two times, and we, we can receive the signal back from it, probably at Goldstone again, you know, 42 hours later, that, 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 that's, that's, that's just phenomenal. But even at Mars, where we have lots of spacecraft, the round trip light time can be up to 48 minutes when Mars is the furthest away as it can get from the Earth. So clearly TCP IP as a protocol does not work in deep space. You have to have some other ways of doing this. So that's uh, one way we're not like the internet. Spacecraft memory, by the way, is, is, is precious because you can't upgrade. And you also can't, you can't erase the memory until you've gotten all the files off of it safely and back to Earth and you verified it. And that's mostly a manual process today because we don't have protocols in place like TCPIP that allow us to have, have faith that we've had a, a real transmission of the file. Another thing that makes us different is our network topology is always changing. All of our spacecraft are always in motion, even the ones that are landed, because the planets are always in motion too. Um, the Earth is always rotating, the planets are rotating. And so the, the network topology is moving all the time. And in fact, I like to say it's governed by astrology rather than by any normal kind of science. And that's because if you look at the, this, this graphic that I have, if you're unlucky enough to have all your planets aligning like this, it's a bad day for the deep space network because we tend to have all of our spacecraft near planets. And so that means all of our antennas are pointed in the same direction and all of our customer spacecraft are in the same part of the sky. And we don't have enough antennas to do that. Uh, and so astrology is, is also sort of our enemy. You don't want to have these alignments. The connections are also temporal. Whereas on, on Earth, the terrestrial internet, you can pretty much assume that once you have a link established with multi-hops, all those nodes are going to stay in place for the duration of your communication session, mostly. But in, but in space, that's totally different. As the Earth moves, the DSN stations move in and out of view of any particular spacecraft. The spacecraft are occulted by the planets if they're orbiting around them or if they're landing on them as the planets rotate. Uh, the spacecraft are periodically occulted by the sun. If you have a spacecraft that's visiting Mars, every once in a while, once every two years or so, Mars goes behind the sun from our view, and then we have no communications. Spacecraft may need to turn from their science observations to communicate with the Earth. So if you look at the spacecraft I have as an example here, it has a fixed antenna on, on, on its body. And so it also has cameras probably on the other side. If it's taking pictures of Jupiter in this case, it has to be rotated to look at Jupiter. When it's communicating, it, the whole spacecraft has to rotate and look back at the Earth. And so it can't be acquiring science at the same time it's communicating. So again, it can only communicate when it's, when it's pointed toward Earth, so that's temporal. And the spacecraft may not, might not have enough power anyway to do both its observations and communication simultaneously because they have to carry whatever power sources they have with them or they have to rely on solar power and some of these spacecraft are pretty far from the sun. Because of all this, one thing that makes us a lot different than the internet is all of our connections are scheduled in advance, often 12 weeks or more in advance. And the reason for the 12 weeks is because these missions themselves have to be sort of autonomous. They can't be joystick because of the long uh, round trip light time. And so we tend to, to program our spacecraft like semi-autonomous robots. And those programs tend to last multiple weeks. And so we need to schedule our communication sessions so when the spacecrafts are operating autonomously far from Earth, they know when their communication sessions are going to be. They can turn toward the Earth and turn on their transmitters. The scheduling process, by the way, is a collegial process. We don't, in the DSN, tell the spacecraft when they're going to communicate. Instead, the spacecraft users meet periodically, discuss their, their requirements over the next period of time, and agree to a mutually beneficial schedule, which we then execute. The gist of this is actually today, every bit of every hop of every link is pre-scheduled. 
The DSN is also a constrained resource. Uh, we communicate with about 35 missions in flight every day. And the day I completed my talk, these are the 35. And it varies a little bit, but mostly the same, about the same set, 35 out of say 40 spacecraft that are in deep space. And you'll notice, by the way, that there are US spacecraft here, and there are ESA spacecraft here, and there are Japanese spacecraft here, and so forth. It's, it's, it's an international endeavor, and we track everybody's spacecraft. But the DSN only has 13 antennas. So you can see we can't necessarily be communicating with all of these spacecraft at once. We may talk to them every day at some point, but the schedule tells us what time during the day. And by the way, although we have 13 antennas, often one or more are down for periodic maintenance because you can't, you can't change something on the antenna while it's working. And we have some special new challenges just, just for this decade. We have human spaceflight. We have astronauts that are traveling beyond low Earth orbit for the first time since the Apollo missions. Uh, this, the, this is the Artemis program and the Gateway spacecraft and their, their commercial spacecraft that are doing this and so forth. And, and human, human flight has its own special needs. One of them is when the humans on board a spacecraft, we need to have two antennas pointing at that spacecraft from the DSN for redundancy because of, because of human safety um, protocols. And so it's, it's even harder for the DSN to communicate with human spacecraft. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have nanosats. We have this nanosat rev revolution, which is occurring all over the world. People have the ability to build very, very small spacecraft and launch them cheaply because the launch cost is a function of the mass of the spacecraft. And it's not just low Earth orbit where most of these spacecraft are occurring, but even in deep space. And in fact, we are to blame ourselves because we flew the first two deep space CubeSats, which were called MARCO from Mars, uh, Mars CubeSat um, something or other, Mars CubeSat O. Um, these are the first deep space CubeSats, and they were actually flown to be relay orbiters for Mars. Um, when InSight, the, the, um, the last lander we had, not a rover, but before the Mars 2020 rover, we had Mars InSight. And when it landed near the beginning of the pandemic, I believe, um, it, land, it landed in a, in, a, in a part of Mars that we couldn't see from the Earth at the time. And we knew that in advance, because you, you, can, you can predict all of that, of course. And so what we did was we, we piggybacked two CubeSats on that launch, these Marco spacecraft, and when InSight arrived at Mars, those CubeSats were at Mars, and they were positioned between, uh, between the um, InSight lander and us so that we could relay images and files from InSight as it was landing through the CubeSats and back to Earth. Artemis 1, by the way, which is scheduled now to launch in June, I believe. This is the, the proof of concept or the prototype for, for the Artemis um, human missions, except it won't have people on board this time, but it's the same capsule, same launch vehicle and so forth. It's carrying 11 CubeSats with it into deep space. And we in a DSN have to track nine of them. So that's an instantaneous um, going from about 35 spacecraft to about 45 spacecraft just overnight. So how do we cope with all these challenges? We're not like the internet. We have all these challenges, what do we do? We do basically these four things, and I'm going to talk about each of, each of them in a little bit of detail. We leverage resources around the globe. We don't do this by ourselves. It's an international community, as I mentioned on the very first slide. Second thing we do is we optimize our links, get the most from them when they're used that we possibly can. We don't waste energy. Third, we find novel ways to share DSN resources among missions. And, and, and fourth, uh, we've introduced autonomy and automation wherever we can to make it easier to deal with a large set of missions. So the deep space community is a global community. As I mentioned, we have international standards that, that govern how we communicate. Uh, we have our own international standards body, the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, or CCSDS. It's under the auspices of ISO nowadays. And it is what the world space agencies use to be able to share 
providing services to deep space missions. It creates huge flexibility in planning ground station deployment, maintenance, and upgrades. And I have three photographs here just to show you some of our international partners. Uh, you see a, um, wow, I can't even see this. I think that's an ESA antenna. Yeah, ESA, um, ESA that's right. ESA has, yeah, ESA has deployed something like the Deep Space Network, but smaller. They have 35 meter antennas, one each, at three locations around the world. And, and we share, as you say, the same standards so we can track each other's spacecraft. Uh, the antenna in the center is USADA, 64 meter antenna operated by the JAXA um, people in Japan. And on the right is a, uh, is a DLR, German Space Agency antenna. It's a, a worldwide community of people that have spacecraft in deep space and large antennas. We're also creating a federated network that includes astronomy dishes. So these are not antennas that were built for communications, but antennas that are built as radio telescopes. Um, but luckily, um, there's a lot of technology in common between those applications and a lot of interest in organizations that run these to also do deep space communications. And so uh, we're working on creating standards for federating this network. And you can see two examples in the photographs. The one on the left is a 64 meter antenna at Parks in Australia. If you've seen the movie, The Dish, it was all about this antenna. It participated in the Apollo lunar landing. And the one on the right is a new antenna, or newer, it's the Sardinia radio telescope that's um, operated in Italy. And we're working with, a, a, they're a new antenna and they have been shadow tracking some deep space missions and working to be able to kind of an operational deep space station as well. Second thing we do is optimize our links. We don't want to waste any energy and get as many bits per second as we can back from a spacecraft with limited energy and a limited antenna size. And we've done very well in improving this over the years. But this graph is a little hard to understand, so let me take a moment to explain it. The x-axis is easy, that's time. The y-axis is different, it's equivalent data rate from Jupiter. And what that means is each point in this, in this stair-state curve is an actual measured data rate from a spacecraft. But those spacecraft are all over the solar system. So what we've done to eliminate this 1 over d squared dependence to actually look at the rest of the system to see how well it's working, is we have in our minds moved each of those spacecraft to Jupiter and, and scaled back the um, data rate uh, to what it would have been if that spacecraft were a Jupiter instead. So what you have left is the communication systems performance with the 1 over d squared term normalized. And so you see how well the rest of the system works. And what you can see very clearly is a 13 order of magnitude improvement since we started launching missions into deep space in the late 50s and until today. And that is all about doing things you need to do to optimize the link. Obvious things are larger antennas. The DSM started with smaller antennas, and now we have up to 70 meter antennas. We can array antennas. Spacecraft fly larger antennas, but that's sort of the easy thing. Other things are harder. We've moved our communications frequency up from a gigahertz or so to today up to 32 gigahertz. The higher the frequency we communicate with, the narrower the beam that comes out of the spacecraft antenna, the more focused it is, and the more energy is focused back to the Earth. So that improves communications performance. We've also improved modulation and coding over the years. For those of you who understand some coding theory or had your, your coding theory 101 course, uh, we typically operate within a DB or, a DB or two of the Shannon information theory limit for our links. So there's not much improvement left to be had. So all these things together have allowed us to make the most of each of our links so we don't waste bits. Ah, and somehow I, <laughs> here's where this review was supposed to come. Uh, we have, have uh, moved most of our small antennas, our 34 meter antennas, to a design called Beam Waveguide. And the, the picture shows it all. Um, so if you, if you trace the energy that comes from deep space, it hits the main reflector, goes back up to the subreflector, and you can see in, in sort of the orange um, part of the graph how we route that energy back down through the mechanics of the antenna into an underground room. And why do we do that? We do that 
to have an environmentally controlled room so we can have optimized receivers down there that we couldn't have done if we had to have them tipping with the antenna out in the sun. We can also have many different receivers that are optimized for different lengths. And we can rotate that bottom mirror that's in the basement to illuminate one of a set of different receivers around the room. That makes the antenna more flexible and optimizes the link more. It allows us to do maintenance faster as well and reduces the cost of the DSN in many ways. So this is just something else we've done to optimize the link. We're also an early adapter of variable coding and modulation or VCM. And the idea of this is the following. You can see from the graph, the purple parabolic um, curve shows as a function of time the, re the measured received signal to noise ratio from a typical deep space pass. So the Earth rotates, the space truck comes into view, it goes up above, it comes above the horizon, and you start to see the signal to noise ratio rise. The spacecraft reaches a peak where the signal to noise ratio is at its highest, and then it fades back down again. Though in the olden days, we restricted spacecraft to have the same coding and mod modulation during that entire pass. And so if you look at this graph, the dotted lines that are horizontal show the available data rates that the spacecraft might have. We would select the, one of those data rates to maximize the area under this curve, which is proportional to the number of bits we can get back during the pass. So you see we have a lot of choices, but we pick the dark blue one because that has the largest area of any of the other rectangles. And so you set the spacecraft to that data rate, it comes over the horizon, it still can't transmit until it gets to up to a certain signal noise ratio, then it starts transmitting, and we receive the data and we're done. But we can do better. We can do better if we can follow that curve more closely. So if we allow the data rate to change during a pass, then we can follow that curve. And every time the curve is predicted to be up to a certain level where the next data rate is possible, we let the spacecraft transmit at that higher data rate. And, and this works really, really well. And you get almost the total area under the, under the purple curve by doing this, which turns out to be about one and a half times on average, the data rate in the maximum rectangle. So this is a huge increase in data rate without changing anything in the system, except the flexibility of when it can change data rates. Now we've been doing this now for about 30 years. And it's sort of the standard way that we communicate from deep space now. If you were doing this in low Earth orbit, by the way, you would have feedback in the system. So that worked just like TCP IP works. And as soon as it were possible to jump to the next data rate, you would do it. And you wouldn't have to predict it in advance. You would do it just based on, 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 on measurement of the link. In deep space, we can't do that because of the round trip light time. And so all these data rate changes have to be pre-programmed on the spacecraft. We've also automated the DSN in many ways to reduce the cost of operations and allow us to have more antennas at the DSN without having to have more operators at the DSN because it costs a lot to have all the people. So as we've upgraded the equipment at the, at the DSN to be automatable, to be able to respond to automation well, we've we've allowed each DSN operator to start controlling multiple links. In the olden days, an operator was assigned to, at the DSN station, to each spacecraft that came into view, and, and they would work that one link. We started working two links per operator. Then we uh, put in the ability to control the DSN remotely from any of the three locations. And that's what this graph would, the graphic would have showed if it were animated. But you can see, for instance, the Goldstone station, which is in the sunlight in this graphic, it has little arrows in white that, that reach out to the other two complexes, which are in the dark. The idea here is whichever spacecraft, which, whichever the three DSN sites is in, is in the daytime can control the others when they're at night. And as the, as the Earth turns, that means that we only have to staff prime shift at each of the DSN sites. And those operators can control the entire DSN, not just the DSN stations that are at their complex. We call this follow the sun operations. It was a huge cost saver for the DSN. It was so big that we were able to plow the cost savings from it back into building more antennas without increasing the overall budget. And we and and that so 
Automation did two things for us that allowed us to control the cost of the DSN, but did so well that we made a profit, if you, if you will, and we plowed the profit back into building more DSN antennas. We also have the ability to track more than one spacecraft if they happen to be in the same beam of one of our antennas. So you can say, well, these are big antennas and the beams are very narrow, so how is that ever going to happen? Well, it actually happens quite often because we tend to send a lot of spacecraft to the same part of space. And Mars is the example today. Today we have, I think, four or five spacecraft at Mars, plus spacecraft that are on the surface of Mars. And all of those spacecraft are in the same antenna beams of a DSN station when they're in view of the Earth at all. And so today we have the ability, as I say, to talk to four of those spacecraft at once with a single antenna. That makes the antennas much more efficient. And we're working to expand that to an unlimited number of spacecraft through something akin to receiver crowdsourcing. Basically, what we can do is record analog the spectrum uh, of, of where all those spacecraft are and put that in, in a cloud or on the cloud, if you will, and let other people access the file and run local algorithms to detect their own spacecraft. And by doing that, we can essentially have well, not quite infinite because the, the, the spectrum is limited, but we can have dozens of spacecraft in the same beam and track them. We're also making the deep, deep space communication more internet-like. So as we mentioned before, two of the things that make us different from, from the terrestrial internet are the fact that we have long delays and we have lots of disruptions. So perhaps something called delay or disruption tolerant networking makes sense here. And in fact, we are an early adopter of DTN networking. Um, although it's not operational yet in the deep space network, it is in demonstration mode. And we've been working on it for about 15 years. Um, and Vint Cerf, who is one of the inventors of TCP IP, is, is, um, has been working at JPL for those 15 years as a visiting scientist, helping us do this. And the, the goal is something like the graphic shows is really a, a deep space internet that operates like an internet. <clears throat> the benefits of doing this are many, um, and just very quickly, it improves operations and situational awareness. It promotes interoperability and reuse. It makes it helps us use the links even more efficiently than we do today. It provides security, which is something we don't really have in our international standards yet. And it provides a quality of service, which means that we can we can define certain subsets of data from spacecraft as more important than others and allow them to be returned more quickly. So just a few things that we're doing in demonstration mode. There is actually one place in NASA where it is operational today, but it's not in deep space, and that's on the International Space, space Station, the ISS. Most, most science payloads that are doing science experiments on the ISS today bring their data back to Earth using DTN. Lunar Ice Cube, which is one of those fly-along CubeSats that'll launch on Artemis 1, um, it, um, has a DTN demonstration on it. Uh, Korea is launching in, 20, in August of this year a uh, Lunar Pathfinder, which will also have a, a DTN experiment. And LunaNet, which is the architecture we've been developing internationally, specifically for lunar exploration, has DTN as one of, its, one of its underpinnings. So these are all things that are about to happen. So to bring it to a conclusion, deep space communications is like the internet, and it's also not like the internet. We've enabled communications of spacecraft for more than 60 years, and during that time, we've improved communications by about 13 orders of magnitude. But we need much more in the future. The future is very challenging. And the goal is something that we've been calling the interplanetary network, which in our minds is a true internet-like experience across the solar system, modulo the round-trip lifetimes, of course. And JPL is working on this together with the universities and the international community. And I think it's a very exciting field, and maybe we can attract some of you into it. And with that, I will draw my slides to a conclusion, leaving 15 minutes for discussion. All right, thanks so much, Les, for the great talk. Um, so, all right, so uh, let me see how I can do it here. I'm gonna stop sharing, but I can pull back the slides if it's necessary. Um,
I just accept the full screen mode here. Um, folks who have questions, please raise your hands here on, on, on Zoom. You can also ask the questions uh, on Slack. And I, I see two questions here at Slack, but uh, I just want to ask you something too, uh, Les, before I go to the questions at Slack. Sure. So, uh, so can you try to give us a sense of how, how much of a bottleneck is the data transmission for spacecraft Let's say, suppose you have a spacecraft you send to a planet, let's say Jupiter or something. You could have all the sensors, spectrometers, you can have radio, you have cameras. You could, in theory, send, you know, uh, high definition video to Earth in, in real time. But I mean, the median, I mean, there's a lot of noise. So can you give us a sense about the deploying the design of the spacecraft, how much data they have to, how much they take into account that they cannot be able to transmit all the data, how much they have to process the data in the probes and compress. Uh, can you give a sense of that? Sure. So an example we typically use is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is one of the Mars orbiters we have today. It's not the newest one, but it turns out to be one with a very high bandwidth. Uh, and, um, and that's because it, ha it has some very high resolution sensors on board, some of the highest resolution Mars sensors we've ever put in Mars orbit. We figured that during its prime mission, it was only able to bring back 1% of the data that it could have acquired with those sensors. So that's an example of the bottleneck. Now, why did we send it with that? It was because we needed high resolution photos of certain parts of Mars, particularly parts we were interested in landing on later. Um, but we could have brought back a lot more and learned a lot more about Mars if, if we didn't have this bottleneck. It's not the only bottleneck we have, but it's definitely a bottleneck. And, and it gets worse when you get further from Mars. If you're a Jupiter, it's worse than that because it's just harder to have the same amount of power and antenna size and so forth that you can get to Mars because Jupiter is that much further away. Yeah. And how much more benefit like optics are going to bring to this field in the future, you think? Yeah. So as I mentioned, although today all the links are radio, uh, we, uh, we are currently about ready to launch our first nearly operational deep space optical link. Um, that'll be on the Psyche spacecraft, which launches in the fall. And um, that will demonstrate about a factor of 10 improvement over the highest, the, the best radio links we have today. We think that we can get uh, another factor of 10 on top of that with optical because it's, it's sort of at the beginning of its, of its technology growth curve. So maybe two orders of magnitude more from optical communications. Nice. Very nice. All right, so uh, we have some more questions here on the Slack channel. I don't see any questions now at Zoom. I mean, I don't see anybody raising hands, so I'm going to read the questions here uh, to Les. Uh, Florian is asking how much uh, power output in watts are these radio links of spacecraft actually have, how much power they have if they are using uh, uh, direction antennas, tracking other link parties, partners, or if they're using omnidirectional direction or being forming nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, so almost all communications in deep space is directional antennas. They all look like DS antennas that are small. They're, they're, they're dish antennas. With the exception of most spacecraft also have an omni or at least a hemispheric antenna for use in emergencies. If something goes wrong and the spacecraft can't point anymore, an omni antenna is still very useful at a very low data rate. Uh, but, but all of the workhorse stuff is with directional antennas. Um, in terms of the amount of power, that depends on where you are in the solar system and what kind of what kind of power generation you have on board. Uh, but even even our largest transmitters tend to be on the order of, of 50 to 100 watts, and most of them are smaller than that. Uh, the efficiency of, of a spacecraft transmitter is no better than about 50 percent, and so to generate 100 watts of power, you need 200 watts input, uh, and that's. 200 watts is very hard to come by in parts of the solar system. If you're far from the Earth, uh, we, we, for instance, we do fly solar powered spacecraft as far away as Jupiter nowadays, but they have really big solar arrays and, and, and we're really stingy with how we spend the power. Spacecraft that go further away carry radioisotope thermal generators, which are basically lumps of, of plutonium that generate heat that's converted into electricity. Wow. All right. Nice. Okay, moving on to the last next question from Lars. Uh, this is probably a silly question, uh, but building there are no silly questions. <laughs> All right, but building a handful of additional antennas would render the scheduling problem avoid, like it would solve the problem. Uh, 
and he goes uh, on. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, finish the question first. Yeah, I mean, at any point of time, a bunch of the 35 stations is behind some planet or something, and hence can anyways not to communicate with, or do I get this wrong? So if you build more antennas, does it solve the problems? I think that's the... Uh, so if you had if you had a lot more antennas, it would solve that problem. Except people would probably want more then. Um, <laughs> but the but those antennas are expensive. Um, a thirty four meter antenna costs about maybe sixty to seventy million dollars to build. It takes two years. They're basically like big battleships that can rotate. I mean, or big bridges. It's big chunks of metal. They're very heavy and very. Uh, very expensive. They're dangerous to build, but um, uh, basically, if if you're a, a space agency like NASA, and you have a choice between building a few more antennas and launching another spacecraft, you're probably going to launch the spacecraft instead. And and so there's always this this trade off. You want to have the minimum number of antennas you can live with, so you can launch as many spacecraft as you possibly can, because the spacecraft are the primary sources of science. Hmm. Here we go. All right, thanks. Uh, Oliver Garcer is also asking, he's saying, thanks for your, thank you for the fascinating talk. I have a question related to security. I'll just give a little feedback, a uh, little feedback. Uh, uh, less. There's a lot of folks in our field who work for internet security. Um, I bet so, yeah. <laughs> so his question is, would it be possible for a state level attacker to interfere with or manipulate the DNSCN communications uh, with their own antenna or like jamming signals or something? And are there safeguards in place to mitigate that? Yeah. So for years and years, the safeguard was you couldn't talk to a spacecraft in deep space if you didn't have a 70 meter or 34 meter antenna. Oh. <laughs> okay. And, and, and in fact, that, that does help a lot. But as you know, nowadays, most, most break-ins, most security break-ins are, are happen, happen in the IT domain. You don't need to have the antenna. You break into somebody's IT system and use their existing antenna. So, so we do have concerns. And in fact, there's, there is a new NASA policy, which is probably gonna go international soon, that um, all spacecraft within a certain distance, so at the moment they're starting with anything two million kilometers or closer to the Earth, have to encrypt their commands on the uplink. So the uplink, well, uplink is what we call anything we send to the spacecraft. And a subset of that are commands. That's what the, the commands are, the instructions to tell the spacecraft to do something. That's what we're concerned about in a security sense. And, 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 and there's a policy that says those, those command uplinks have to be encrypted. That doesn't actually change anything in the DSN because we receive commands from, from the, the operating centers for each mission and just echo them to the spacecraft. But it means that those that, the, that those centers that generate the commands for each spacecraft have to put encryption in. And, and, and we're actually developing the software within NASA to do that within my directorate. Yeah, all right, nice, thanks. Another question from uh, the Zoom chat here. Um, uh, what kind of lessons or protocols and mistakes we did or we apply in the internet nowadays? Do you think that can be applied to the DSN? So like applying lessons for the internet can be applied to the DSN uh, types of communications. So taking lessons from the internet to the DSN, I think that's... Uh... So that would, that would involve me knowing everything that you do on the internet, which I don't. But, <laughs> right. but I will say that, I mean, I know that a lot of, a lot of error correcting codes are in common, that um, you see things like read Solomon codes and so forth yep. that are... That, that are used in internet applications. And those are things we use in deep space all the time. Um, and um, compression, we, the compression that we use for science data from spacecraft, uh, it, it's basically the same kinds of algorithms that are used on the internet, you know, JPEG kinds of things and, and, and so forth. And, and, and although we don't, although today we don't have something like DTN in the stack, um, we do in, have human in the loop um, feedback for for assured communications. Uh, we have we have we've we've channelized our data, and we have people checking it on the ground that and send send responses to the spacecraft later through the command link to say you can erase certain parts of memory. So it's not efficient, but it's internet like. All right, I hear what you're saying. All right, thanks. Uh, another question from the, the channel here. Christian Montani is asking, thanks, for, thanks a lot for your, such a great talk. I have a question about the future network internet in space. 
uh, how would you tr how would it work? Take into account theory theory of or relativity that each space, space, spacecraft would have its own time, but you have to you know sync somehow then together clocks. Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. Completely correct, and I, I glossed completely over that. Deep space communications is one of the areas where relativity makes a difference. We have spacecraft that are in gravity wells of other planets. They're not moving at relative speeds, but they are. I mean, when, you, when you're predicting when a spacecraft is going to emerge from behind a planet, you use relativity in that, in that computation, and it makes a difference hmm. because fractions of a second make a difference. Um, and reasons fractions of a second make a difference is because of the navigation kinds of stuff we do. When we're measuring Doppler and range with the spacecraft, we're doing that at picosecond levels in general. And, and so we do have to understand what the time is on the spacecraft versus the time on the ground. And so we do that using common filters and things like that today in a predictive way. Um, but it's absolutely important. And, and, and in fact, we have used deep space communications many times over the years to prove general relativity over and over again. There are experiments where you say relativity says this is going to happen, and it does, and, and you push it to the next decimal point. Einstein's theory was right now to so many decimal points, and a lot of that uses deep space communications. Very nice, sweet. Um, one thing that was not in a talk, but I probably read somewhere, or saw you on, 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 in one of your presentations that I saw on YouTube, it's that like we are like in the field of uh, internet measurements. We love some sort of a hacking in the way that and we use a protocol that's designed to do something and you try to reuse for something else. And I saw you, I, you presented the ways you can differently use a DSM-4. Uh, but I think it was the Saturn, Saturn rings that the, you folks measured. Can you tell yes. that story? That's yeah. a great story. So, so that was one of the things, that was one of the slides that when I was showing it, it skipped over and I couldn't oh. get back to it. So I did have a slide on that. If you want to bring it up. Oh yeah, let me yeah, try. It is slide number... Five. Five, all right. Five here is Canberra. Oh, sciences. DSM sciences? This DSM one? science. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. So one of the other things we use the DSM for is we actually use it as a science measurement, as a science instrument. So I can't see the slide yet. You're not sharing. Yeah, I'll do it right now. Just a second. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. So, so in the graphic, we have a DSM station down at the bottom. We have a spacecraft. This is... Um, this is Cassini at Jupiter, it turns out. Uh, but, and, and so you can see a communication signal coming back through it, and it passes through the rings. And so basically what we can do with the DSN in a mode like this is, is, is we can measure attenuations of the signal as, as particles occult it from the rings. We can look at the spacecraft wobble, which tells us something about the gravity of the, of, of the body it's near. We look at frequency deviation. These things let us learn directly about rings and particles in the path, about atmospheres on the planet. As again, as the space trip goes behind a planet, there's a small period of time where this where the signal goes through the atmosphere if it exists, and we measure atmospheric density versus altitude. Uh, we can measure the uh, um, models of the interiors of the bodies uh, because um, as as the as a body moves, if it has a liquid interior, it wobbles, and we can see that on the spacecraft motion. And this allows us everything we know about about theories of under underground oceans on moons and other planets, about rings and so forth. All of that comes from the, using the DSN as a science instrument. So, in fact, this very famous photograph that you see that was taken by Cassini of the rings of Saturn, those rings are not actually from a photograph. They're actually recreated from the model from DSN observations. Wow, it's fascinating. Yeah. So it allows us. And, and, and we can even operate the DSN as a radar. We have some of the world's biggest transmitters as well because we need them to communicate with things like Voyager. Mm -hmm. And so we have high power transmitters, large antennas. That means we have a good radar system. And we've used this to see through atmospheres. We had the first photographs of the surface of Venus, the first photographs of the surface of Titan, which is a moon with a thick atmosphere um, around Saturn. And um, we also have studied terrain where we're going to, where we're going to land spacecraft because just having photographs of the surface of Mars wasn't good enough to pick a landing site. You had to understand what that terrain was in three dimensions so you don't land on, on something that's crooked by 40 degrees and yeah. the spacecraft topples over. 
Wow. And, and so having radar observations, we, we, we now do those from, from Mars orbit. But before we had Mars orbit, we did this with the DSN. Yep. Here we're All the yeah. lunar landing sites and so forth that we've used in the past have been the result of DSN observations of the surface of the moon. And, we, and currently, the thing we do most with the DSN in this is we look at asteroids that come close to the Earth. They're discovered optically, oh. but once we have a radar observation of them, we can we can measure their trajectory for 100 years into the future very accurately. We can know whether they're going to hit us or not, and we can learn about their composition and their shape and, and so forth. And so th this is a very important part of what we do with the DSN. Very nice. Um, just a quick question because we're going to have to move to the next session. Uh, I understand, yeah. yeah. Do you, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if that's that's public information, but do you have a sense how much does it cost to run the DSN per year? If it's if you could disclose that, if you know that, it's about two hundred million U.S. dollars a year. It's part of the federal budget, which is which is public domain. All right. Okay. Yes or no? Yeah. All right. Um, Les, thank you so much for being here today with us. I think a lot of us have learned a lot. It's really out of our comfort zone. I love the challenges that you folks have, and I'm going to have to read more stuff on it because I'm really fascinated by that. So thanks a lot for being here today with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks again for inviting me. I intend to stick on for most of the next session as well. <laughs>